show you the way. I know for sure you won't end up in the wrong place. Is there anybody who want the Lord to show them the way? This oh, there could be no greater request than asking the Lord to show you which direction you should go in. Amen, amen. We say good morning to our Facebook and YouTube family. Always good to have you in our worship experience. So let us pray. Kind and merciful God, we stand now once again before your people, Lord, ready to share the good news of your word. Hide me now, God, behind the sacred desk here so that, oh God, what I have been going through this week will not take away from what your people need to hear on today. Cover me, God, like you've always done so that my imperfection will not be a distraction, but only they see the glory of you in this place. Yeah. We're thankful, God, that you've allowed me yet another opportunity to share and to preach your word to your people, oh God, knowing that, God, if we hear your word, but yet and then become yeah. doers, our lives will be so much better. Yes. For these and other blessings we ask in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. If you'd be so kind and if you would turn with me to the book of Luke. Luke, the 10th chapter, verses 25 through 37. And I'm using the NIV for the translation this morning. The book of Luke.
do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into thy hands, the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go do likewise. Our key verse is verses 36 and 37 as you take your seats. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied. He didn't give a name so anybody can put their name right there. Amen. The one who had mercy on him, Jesus said, go and do likewise. Just for a few minutes, I'd like to preach from this thought. Too many fans and not enough followers. Too many fans and not enough followers. Beloved, in today's worship, sensationalism has become the order of the day. The more that a preacher or a pastor can preach out of the box, if you will, the more that they can create a style and an entertainment atmosphere that will excite the crowd, uh, everyone says that that's the kind of place I want to be. Yeah. More and more individuals are looking for outrageous types of expression in the pulpit and they are looking for unscriptural theology. In other words, they are looking for messages that really don't line up with the word of God. And if you would watch some of YouTube uh, sermons and watch some of the sermons on Facebook, you see a great multitude going to places like that for uh, we doing line dances in uh, on the altar and we, we were singing songs that just came out of the club but it's okay if we are in church because we are trying to bring a lot of folk in. We, we have now become entertainers instead of preachers, preachers of the gospel. The more you tell people how much they are going to receive in a blessing and the less you tell them about the responsibility for the blessing they will shout the more. The more, the more you entertain and say and stay away from the true gospel, they will tell others, man, you ought to come and hear that preacher. It's good over there. Yeah, yeah. What has become of the black church today? For many pulpits have abandoned what was labeled when I grew up was solid word. But we have now moved quickly to the fast food world that satisfies our appetite for the day, but damages our soul for tomorrow. All right. mm, too many fans and not enough followers. We have abandoned scripture and turned to test the line. Going on are the days to hear that we must suffer in this life in order to be a true follower of Christ. Gone are the days that require us to have a commitment and a consistency in our service. Gone are the days that we must deny ourselves in order to be what God is calling us to receive God's direction. Gone are the days that we tell all of the followers that the promises that you have heard are all going to come right here on this side. No, you don't have to wait for the hereafter. We have become fans and not followers. But I'm here today to tell you the devil is a liar. God is truly looking for us to return to structure and substance that sustain us, not just pacify us, for the moment and leave us empty as a man who forgot to bring his water when he entered the desert at 110 degrees. Okay. When we take a look at John the 6th chapter verse 26 we see the same thing happening in our churches today. Let me give you John the 6th chapter verse 26. Jesus answered, I'll tell you the truth. You are looking for me not, hear me now, not because you saw miracle signs, 
But because you are or you ate the loaves and had your fear. Yeah, yeah. The reason why they came and they flocked to Jesus because they wanted what they wanted for themselves. Not so much concern about getting their souls in the right order. They came for programs. They came for, what are you handing out today, Pastor? They came for, I hope I win the number so that God can bless me because I heard that every Sunday you call out a number and you give some money away. They came for stuff, not for substance. Too many fans and not enough followers. Right. What makes you a fan or a follower of Jesus? Right. Well, in 2024, Jesus is going to approach many of us just like a beautiful black sister will approach her partner that she has been dating now for six years. Hear me right. now. She's been dating this brother for six years and she's reaching her 40th birthday and she's going to ask him, I need you to explain the D-O-R. I'll help you with that. Here's what the D-O-R stands for. The D stands for defined. The, the O stands for hour. And the R is the relationship. I don't need you. I've been dating you for six years. I'm reaching my 40th birthday. By now, I thought you would have put a ring on it. But I need you to define our relationship. God is asking somebody this morning, I need you to define our relationship. For I have been blessing you. I have been taking care of you. I have been bringing you through when you call on my name. But I need to know what type of relationship do we have? Are you a fan? Are you a father? Well, let me give you some definition between the two. A fan. A fan will put many religious quotes on Facebook and Twitter. A follower will be the quote that he posts. A fan will put many crosses around his or her neck. A follower will just bear his or her cross. A fan will put a long gospel song at the end of their answer machine, at the end of their message. But a follower will just meditate on the gospel. A fan will put on his license and play, Jesus is my co-pilot. But a follower will let Jesus just be the pilot. Are you a fan? Or are you a follower? We have too many folks who declare that they are a follower of Jesus, but they cannot have any consistency in what the word shows me that they really are a follower. Right. Only you know, you can now begin to evaluate yourself. Am I really a fan? Or am I a follower? Oh, wow. Over and over we see this scene being played out in the Christian walk with Christ. We are selective hear me now when it comes to answering the question about our relationship with Jesus. For at times, we are 100% followers. Yes, if I told you right now that everybody is going to leave here with $1,000, we wouldn't have to worry about these pews being empty. But after, you don't know if that's going to happen or not. You say, well, I, I got my barbecue ready to be put on in a few hours, so I think they'll, Pat Jesus will understand that I'm not at church today. Well, uh, but he brought you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And he's only asking just for a few minutes today. But you got so much else that you need to give him or give to somebody else and then to give to the one who made it possible for them ribs you're going to eat in a few hours. But at other times, we are vacillating between 40 and 50% as a follower based on what truth the Bible contradicts in our actions. Yeah. If we lack what the Bible, or if we lack what we are doing and the Bible require change, mm -hmm. then I ain't gonna follow too much. Because yeah. you know what, I like what I do. Right. Yeah. I like being yeah. me. Are you finding yourself doing me often? 
Uh -huh, because the Bible says uh, there ought to be a change in you. And, and that that old have passed away and all things have become new. But there's some old stuff that I still lack. And so Jesus, because it's good to me and it feels good to me. I can't follow you right now. I, I know what the words say, but that right now, I'm just going to be a fan. Ah, uh, question. If you were, a question I need to ask. If you uh, were called in to the holy examination room and uh, Jesus sent his M.A. in to weigh you, Dr. Jesus is coming in a few minutes, but he told me to get your vital signs and check your weight level. And, and if your uh, if we had to weigh you on a scale today to find out which end would you be on, on the left is a fan, and on the right is a follower. And if you stepped on the spiritual stage or scale of Jesus that he weighed your relationship. Would you be on the left? Or would you be on the right? For you've got to make up your mind. What weight are you going to be? Are you going to be a fan? Or are you going to be a father? A young lady was asked a question about her diet. And she shared that she was a vegetarian. But she still had a high desire for some bacon. She said, I, I, I'm a vegetarian. I, I switched over now. I, I don't like some meat, but I got a high desire for some good old bacon. And she went on to share that at times, she classified herself as a flexitarian. A flexitarian. Well, I thought you said you was a vegetarian. No, I'm a flexitarian. Oh, she stated that depending on the situation, she would alter her diet to eat some bacon. Uh, that's why she felt that she was a flexitarian 60% of the time. Why? What are you saying, Pastor Benjamin? We got too many flexitarians in the church because Jesus needs to know, are you a fan? Are you a follower? For the Bible says that you either be hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, you're a vegetarian. God says, I've got to spew you out of yeah. my mouth. Yeah. Yeah. We got too many flexing people today. Yeah. For you told me one thing, but then when I saw you again, I thought I could count on what you told me. And you done flexed on me. You, 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 you done decided that. Well, I did tell you that, but I'm flexing today. You know, uh, you know uh, flex time came about and everybody likes flex time, but not all flex time is good. When, when it comes to Jesus, you can't be flexing. You, you've got to put your foot in the ground and you've got to take a stand. Nothing that I hate worse. They don't know where you stand yeah, yeah. with me. Uh, God had my landscapers came and worked on my yard and they said they'll be there Tuesday morning. But when you tell me Tuesday morning you'll be there 801, you're late. Because that's Tuesday morning. Matter of fact, I was already in the yard before then. Got to be 9 o'clock. I said, my God, where are they? Finally! I couldn't take it no more. I texted him. I said, where are you at? We're going to be there a little after 10. I said, you said you were coming Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning for me, I know it says from 6 a.m. or really 12 or 1 a.m. to all the way to 12 noon is in the morning. But my morning is 8 a.m. Yeah. You should have told me that you were going to come at 10 rather than show up uh, uh, they didn't show up at 8 because I had a mindset for getting my day started and I could go on and do my thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Too many folks flex yeah. and you just don't know where they are in their life. Right, right. In this text today, it is very clear for us to see who was a fan of Jesus and who truly was a follower. Come with me to verse 31 and 32. 
31 says, a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, what did he do? I ain't got time for him. He stepped up to the other side. Well, so too, a Levite, a man of God, when he came to that same place and he could see from a distance, he says, I can't let that derail me. How awful it is that those who should be willing to help, those who should have a heart to help, are the same folk who will step on the other side. Church folk, yeah. preachers, yeah. stepping on the other side because they got to do me. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. yeah. I, I don't know why the, what they moved on the other side. Maybe someone said the priest might have didn't want to uh, miss his preaching assignment. Uh, the Levite didn't want to touch something because you know they were about the law and if he touched something that was unclean, I got to go through a whole lot of process to get me back where I am now. Uh, don't you know how much I paid for this suit? It's too clean, brother, for me to touch something that gonna cause me that nobody else gonna see what I got on. Mm. Too many of us are too concerned about what will offend our new car if I pick up somebody who don't smell or look as good as me. Don't you know they have cleaning products that you can clean anything? But we're so concerned about how nice my stuff is that I can't let somebody else contaminate it. Let's look at the scripture in Matthew 16, verses 24 and 25. It will help us understand what it takes to become a true follower of Jesus. Matthew, the 16th chapter, Verses 24 and 25, I'll read it to you. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must what? Deny themselves. Not just deny yourself. Take up their cross. Not enough just to pick up something. And then what? Follow me. In other words, uh, you must uh, deny your me, myself, and I, you must uh, pick on a charge or pick up a charge of responsibility, and then you must still stay in the narrow as you follow Jesus. Yeah, yeah. For whosoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whosoever loses their life for me will what? Find it. Well, brother, let's go with these two points I have today, and we've done. They're going to let you get on back to your family. Let's apply these, this scripture to the text today. Too many fans and not enough followers. Right. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whosoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Yeah. So, beloved, uh, if you are going to move from being a fan to a follower. I'm at my first point. Here's what you must do. Your following of Jesus will require leaving something behind. If you're going to be a true disciple, one that Jesus can count on, you have to leave some things behind. Right then and there, that's, that's the problem with many of us because we have stuff that we keep bringing along and Jesus told us, I've already changed you and you need to let that go. But, but we, for some reason, either think we can rehabilitate it or we can't live without it or it's too good to let it go but we just got it. And Jesus said, but you got to let it go. There are some things that if you're going to be in the company with me, you're going to have to leave behind. You see, the reason why some of us can't move further than life that we are, because there are some things we won't let go. There are some people we won't let go. And Jesus didn't say that you don't 
you should not stop loving. He never said that. He just said that there are some folk for where are you going? Ah, they will contaminate it. Not even with you, but just if they have the scent on you that you were in their company. That's messed up, y'all. They, they don't have to be with you, but they got the what? Scent of you on them. Jesus said, you're going to have to leave that crowd. There are some family members uh -huh, that you're going to have to leave behind. Saw this kid, and this one had to be a skit. It was a skit on Facebook. The boy said, and I, I forget what the name was. He said, Uncle Joe called Mama, and Uncle Joe said, uh, why can't y'all allow him to come to the cookout? And the mama spoke up and said, because last time Uncle Joe was here, he cut up and he smoked his reefer or his weed, and none of us, uh, of our friends here smoked weed, and he made a mess of everything, and he got out of control. And the boy then almost chastised the mama and said, but mama, he ain't, he gonna be outside. Why can't he smoke his weed outside? He's just free air, ain't he, mama? She said, because we have friends, and this is not the atmosphere that we want around our friends. And then he went on to even say even more, Beloved, that wouldn't even happen in my relationship with my mom and daddy. Once mama said, he ain't coming, he ain't coming. She said, go ask your daddy. No, 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 no. Uh, I would the mama said, you ain't got to ask your daddy because we ain't going to have that foolishness within our surroundings. I know you love them. I know uh, they're your blood, but sometimes you got to tell blood, you got to stay where you are, blood. I, today we can't put up with your foolishness. Today we can't have your issues contaminate what we are trying to do. And see, you got to know where you are in your life. And there are just some people, some places, some things, you just going to have to put them back. Uh -huh, I know, I know, I know. That, that, that favorite outfit that you love, but you ain't 21 no more. I get so sick of seeing folk who trying to still look 21 and you 47. Goodwill can use it. I don't care if you still have the size for it. It's not for you. Take it to goodwill. There are some things you've got to learn. That's what I used to do. That's what I was about, but I'm not about that anymore. And where I'm going and where God is going to take me, I've got to leave it behind. Yes, yes, yes. What are you willing to leave behind to follow Jesus? Family, good job, high status in your club. I don't know. What are you willing to leave behind to follow Jesus? If you're going to become a follower, you must leave some things behind. Look, Abraham left his father's house. He had everything going for him. Cattle, donkey, livestock, a beautiful wife family all around him and the Lord spoke to him and said, Abraham you've got to get out of your father's house. And Abraham had to move. The disciples was doing that daily occupation but Jesus said, if you are going to make disciples of men if you're going to follow me man, you got to quit that fishing job. you got to quit, quit whatever job you own and pick up your cross and follow me. Moses, I, I know you got away from Pharaoh. Now you found a beautiful wife and you're living at the foot of Mount Sinai. You got a son and you got a father-in-law and you got a good family. But the Lord said, Moses, I'm calling you out of your comfort zone. Now, there's some folks crying in Egypt and you gonna be my deliverer. You got to go there. And tell that Pharaoh who put you in exile, let my people go. You're going to have to leave some things that are familiar and that are comfortable, but you've got to go. If Jesus tells you to go 
if you've got to get rid of those things if you're going to follow him. Yeah. Beloved, what are you willing to leave in behind of right. you so the Lord can use you? Yes. Well, I'm already at my last point and there's three points. Three parts of my last point. Point two says this, more fan than followers. The second thing that I see here in the text that the Samaritan had, he had character and he embraced three C's. He had character and he embraced these three C's. Compassion, uh -huh. commitment, uh -huh. cost. Yeah, yeah, right. The Samaritan had compassion, commitment, and cause. Come on now, come on now. Verse twenty-four B and take up your cross and follow me. Compassion. Verse thirty-three is where I'm at. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he looked at him, what did he have? Pity. What a shame somebody has beaten this man almost to death. How dare I leave him in the condition that he's in? Verse 34, he went to him and what? He bandaged his wounds up. He poured oil and wine on the wounds, sterilizing it and soothing the man's pain. Beloved, that's what we want today. Is people who have more compassion. Yeah. For we don't have enough compassion in this world today. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, I told you the, the best used line in the world today is I'll pray for you. Because yeah, yeah. uh, yeah. mm -hmm. when I said I'll pray for you, yeah. there ain't no commitment other than I'll pray. Right. There, 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 there's no compassion in a sense. There is compassion, but there's nothing more that I want to do is just, I'm going to say some words. But God is saying, get out of your sense of saying, I'm just going to pray. Pray and work. Have some compassion for the folk. I'm going to pick you up and yes, pray for you. We need more compassionate followers. The second thing of the seed that we see is commitment. Then he put the man on his own oh, yeah. donkey. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, we don't know how far they had to walk, but I'm sure it wasn't a short distance. Uh -huh. But he now lifted the man up and put it on what he had to ride. Yeah. And now the man is riding while he is walking. Oh, and he brought him to an end for him to be taken care of. See, there ain't no enough commitment today. We'll serve you one Sunday, but don't ask us to be four in a row. We'll give you one. Where is the commitment today? God is asking us. I, I said this last Sunday. I'm going to say it again. Y'all going to get mad at me, get mad at me. I said last Sunday. Now, don't just call it you, Sunday. Don't miss today. I ain't gonna call no name, but y'all know who was here last time. Right. I said, commitment. What is it that we don't have commitment about God? But we'll tell God quickly about God, you know what your word said. God says, I know what my word said. I wrote it, but where is your commitment to me? We're always ready to tell God how he ought to be strong and committed and follow through on his blessing and follow through on his word. He said, but I can't get you to remember one commandment. But you're telling me about all the commitments and the promises that I ought to be bringing you. The reason why we don't have this type of commitment is because we are raised in the church, but not in Christ. We're raised in the church, but not in Christ. We, we hear people all the time, I, I go to church, I know that. But what are you getting when you go? Is Christ in you? Or are you, are you just going for the position that you hold? 
so that you can order people around and tell them what to do. But they know Christ in you when you leave there, when you've done with your assignment. Too many of us have no commitment to do the work of the church. The work of Christ. God is saying this Samaritan had commitment. The last C, I've already told you, you need to have compassion. You need to have commitment. This one right here is going to mess you already up because, oh, cause I had to work my way through something. He wanted to pay for him like I had to pay for God. Cause I ain't about to spend no money on them. Cause I got to go out of my way to take you over to 12 miles. Uh, no, no, no. I don't, I don't live over there. Cause too many folk are worried about the cause. Yeah. If you want to have a, a drag, a knockdown, drag out meeting, tell the church you finna take some of the money that they raise yeah, yeah. and you finna do some cost of taking care of somebody that they didn't approve of. Yeah. And watch how quickly you will get voted out. Yeah. Cause. Don't you know that's ours? Well, the last time I looked, is God. The most weirdest statement that I've ever heard when we were in a church fight in Toledo, Ohio. They made a, we were junior deacons and they had a meeting. They said, what we going to do? We're going to go to the bank and tell the bank that we're going to take our portion out because we're going to start a new church. And so we raised our hand, me and uh, Pastor Craig. We were, junior, we were junior deacon. We said, where can the bank tell us where our money stop and they will begin? Matter of fact, it's all God's money. Uh, they don't know any of our members, so how are we going to, you know, you know how crazy that statement is? How are we going to take our money out and say that this rest belongs to them? The, what I'm trying to get you to understand is the Bible tells us that it's going to cost us something. Salvation is free, but the journey will cost you. The Bible says, what will it cost you? It's going to cost you some time. It's going to cost you some patience. It's going to cost you some friends. It's going to cost you some privacy. It's just like that story I just told you the other day, that brother, if you find a good woman, it's going to cost you. What is going to cost you? Some time, some patience, some friends. And some prophet. No, yes, you're going to have to open up your phone. Your phone is her phone and her phone is your phone. You ain't got no more privacy. If you're married, you ain't got no more privacy. Well, that's my stuff over here. He ain't got no business looking over here. Yes, he does. Well, that, that's his stuff over there. She ain't got no business looking at mine. Yes, he does. Jesus says that you become one. And Jesus also says that we become one, one with the Father. If we become one with the Father, surely first lady and I got to become one together. If we're going to be married and follow Jesus, we are what? One. And so it is with Jesus. If you're going to be a follower, there is some cost to pay. But as I close, it's worth it. There is no greater cost than it can be than you do it for Jesus. There is no greater feeling to be able to know that you went beyond just a little bit to go out of your way to make somebody have a better day. Oh, I just love our friend. Ah, uh, and our family member, even though she ain't blood, she likes blood, uh, first lady wise, for she has been taking care of my sister for the last month, and we tried to pay her some money, we tried to give her this, and she said, no, no, I'm not going to take nothing from you, take my sister to every doctor's appointment, sometimes there's three in a week, drive to the other city. 
stay where other doctors are. Sit up with her all night. Cook food for her. Clean up her pharmacy and other stuff that's going on. Jesus said that if you're going to be my follower, it's going to cost you. Are you willing to pay the cost? But look what Jesus did while we were yet sinners. He died on the cross for you. He paid the ultimate cost. For he said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. I'm so glad that Jesus wasn't afraid of a cost. For he paid the ultimate cost. For the God that we serve sent his only begotten son and gave him to a person who put him on a whole rugged cross and crucified him. Even when they tried to encourage Jesus, if you be the son of God, come down. One of the thieves said, but the other one said, we deserve what we're getting. But truly, this man is the son of God. So he's willing to not to call down some leaves of angels, but he's bearing the cost of our sin. Thank you, Father, for paying the cost. Thank you, Jesus, for not letting the cost get in your way. Thank you, Jesus, for being willing to not only have compassion, not only being committed to continue to bless us. But the cost, you said we were worth it. And I'm glad today that because of Jesus being a true follower of the Father, you and I have salvation. Because 